Amen. The book of Romans chapter 12 is where we're going to bring our Bible study today. And you may be seated. I spoke about this on Sunday morning and I want to finish this today uh, in a Bible study. I did not get to Romans chapter 12 because uh, I began to preach. just felt like I followed the Holy Ghost where it led me. And we had a powerful move of God on Sunday. But I want to teach from Romans 12. If you would, open your Bibles up right now with me. We're going to go verse by verse and teach and try to find what the apostle was trying to say to the church at Rome. In Romans 12, we're going to read this. I am going to be teaching today on simply, I am my brother's keeper. I am my brother's keeper. He, he starts off writing, and we're, we are reading in the King James Version here tonight as usual. But Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. How? Holy. He calls every believer to be holy and acceptable, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Let me just word this verse this way. Becoming acceptable God is reasonable. It's not beyond any of us to be holy and to present our bodies a living sacrifice. He goes on and talks more about the believer. He is he's building a narrative of, of the responsibility of a believer. So from this verse you see this. You're going to see this narrative follow all the way through uh, the chapter. But it, Verse 2 he says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So he says to the believer in verse 1, you need to be holy. He says to the believer in verse 2, you do not need to be identified or conformed to this world. He says your mind is not going to be the way the world is. It's going to be transformed, your mind, by the things of God. You're not going to think, you're not going to do, and you're not going to act the way the world acts. You're not going to live the way your family tradition was. You are now a believer and now you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, and to um, become acceptable unto God. Let's look at verse 3. For I say, through the grace given to me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Don't think too high of yourself. And uh, you're not the only one that's a believer. You're not the only one doing something for God. And, uh, but he goes on and says, but you have a responsibility as an individual believer. And that's what he's trying to break down in the narrative is that you're a believer. You have a responsibility as a believer to be holy and to think different than the world. And so he said, there's this responsibility that is sitting up on, uh, that is setting up on your shoulders and it goes on and says, um, For as we have many members in one body, and all members, what does it say? And all members have not the same office. He said there's a lot of members in the body. In the body of Christ there are many members, but they don't all have the same responsibilities. Uh, different ministries. So we being, I want everybody at home to say many there's many of us. The body of Christ is not small. Uh, there are many of us that are part of the body of Christ, but we are one in Christ, and every one members one of another. What that means in that verse is we are members united. We are members together. We are members that are dependent. I want everybody to say dependent. When you say one of another, you are saying, I am dependent on you. My finger is dependent upon my hand. My hand is dependent upon my arm and so forth. It is one of another. It is connected. The narrative that he is teaching is to never think so much of yourself that you think you can live for God all by yourself. 
and uh, to think that you don't, you don't need the body. You don't need anybody else. I'll, I'll just go to church. I'll have my little circle. I'll slip out the door and go home because I don't need them. They don't need me. Don't think that way. It's not biblical. And so Paul is teaching that we are one of another. We are. If my arm hurts, my whole hand is affected. Deferred pain travels through this. And so I understand that members in particular, it affects me if there is a part of my body that is suffering. And so he builds this and he says, we are one body, many different offices, many different members, but we're one. He goes on verse 6 and he says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. See that? Our gifts differ according to what? Grace. That's Grace is God's empowerment. It's unmerited favor. That means I didn't deserve it, but uh, God, God had handpicked me, chosen me for a specific role. You can't be everything to everybody. Uh, and so understanding your role is so important in the body. And he said, according to the grace or God's empowerment, that's why some Christians are very, very frustrated, is because they're trying to be something God did not give them the grace to be. They're trying to fulfill a role that God didn't give them the ability to do. It's like a person that's trying to sing that can't hold a tune. And God didn't give them the grace to sing. And uh, maybe it could be music, something else. And that's just a, 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 common, a common example. But there are so many different giftings that he's going to bring out. And let's look what it says. He said, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. He said, whether prophecy. He said, if that's your gifting. He said, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. He said, if God's called you to prophesy, then prophesy with all the faith that you have. Put everything you have into that, if that's your gifting. That's what one translation would say. Or ministry, another word for that is serving. Maybe God has called you to serve. And he said, or serve, let us wait on our ministering. One translation study would say this way. If, if you've called to serve, then serve well. If you've been called to do something, there is a gifting, then do that well. Don't, don't just do it half-hearted. If he's called you to serve, serve well. He says, or he that teacheth, a teaching. In other words, he said, if God's called you to be a teacher, he said, then teach well. Do whatever God's given you the grace to do, but do it well. Do not live in comparison. Do not live, well, I think I want to be like that. No, you serve in the area that God has given you the grace to serve. I like verse 8 because we need this right now. He said, or he that exhorteth uh, on exhortation. Another word for that is encouraging. He said, if you have been uh, called to be an encourager, he said, then go encourage. Do what you have been called to do. And he moves on. He says, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. And, and that means, that means uh, don't give for self-benefit. He said, if you're a giver, you give to be a blessing to others. And so do that well. I want everybody to say, do it well. He goes on and says, he that ruleth with what? Rule with diligence. And that's talking about leadership. He said, you need to lead, but lead consistently. There ought to be continuity in the leadership. There ought to be consistency in leadership. If God, not everybody's a leader. But if God has called you to lead, certainly we're all leaders in the home. But if God has called us to lead in our communities, on the job, he said, do it with diligence. You, you cannot be back and forth. He is teaching us our role in the body. He said, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Give mercy, but do it cheerfully, not begrudgingly. He said, verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. The only way I know to really explain this is, is, um, is, is to say it this way. To say what this, to say what this simulation is, is maybe to say how not to do this. He said, don't love uh, and it not be sincere. It needs to be sincere. It shouldn't be this, this uh, facade of love or fake love. And it goes on. He said, don't let it be with, with, um, without dissimulation. What he was saying is, you need to love openly. 
You, you, need to, you need to be that. Don't hide that. You need to do it openly. And he moves on and says, abhor that which is evil. Another word for that is extreme hatred. You need to hate sin. That's what he said. You need to hate the things that God hates. You need to abhor. It's an extreme hatred when you use the word abhor. And he said, I'm talking to the body that we cannot become so tolerant in love that we start loving things that are wrong. We love the sinner, but we hate sin. Can everybody say man? He, he moves on and says, uh, abhor that which is evil, but cleave to that which is good. Cleave means I'm going to hold on to it with everything that I have and I'm not going to let go of it for nothing in the world. If it's good, I'm going to, I'm going to hold it. The Bible says buy the truth and sell it not. Can you say amen? You've got to hold on to things that are good. I'm going to tell you what's good is the presence of God. We've got to fall in love with the move of God. I'm going to tell you something else that's good is His divine word. God speaks to us out of His word. Time in His word. Time in His presence. I'm going to tell you something else that is good is our time at the house of God. I'm going to tell you something else that's good. Our brothers and sisters, we need to cleave to the church. In an hour that is, that is certainly unprecedented, in an hour that is uncertain, we need one another. And I, I taught Sunday, I preached about one thing I'm grateful for. I'm grateful for the body that when I'm not where I need to be because of circumstance, I've got a church that will pray without ceasing. Don't ever forget in Acts 12, when the church, be, in, in the book of Acts, when the church began to pray, they prayed Simon Peter out of death. They prayed him out of prison. They really did because they ceased not to pray for him. And God sent an angel and brought a supernatural experience to let him out. And I believe if you're watching right now, one of the benefits of, of the body of Christ is together is that when one of us hurts, we all hurt. When one of us has a need, we can all get together and bind together to make that need be removed out of their life. Thank God for the church. If you feel disconnected tonight, uh, if it's our fault, I'm sorry, we'll do better. But it was never the will of God for you to be a believer, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, and feel disconnected from the body. We are one of another. We need you. I feel like I'm preaching to somebody right now that you stay home because you, you really don't fit in. Can I tell you, it could be a personality flaw. It really could. Maybe you felt that way in the family that you were raised in. Maybe you feel that way because of the mistake you made. But I say to every single person watching, we don't care where you've been and we don't care what you've done. Why don't you come back to the house of God? Come back to the fold. Come back home, I say to somebody watching. I wish somebody right now that's watching would share would share the Facebook right now, would share the live stream right now with somebody because I know where we're living. We're living in the end time and it's not the will of God for us to be isolated. One of the things we find in scripture, God said to Adam, it's not good for a man to be alone. That's why it's been so hard week after week trying to make decisions because I realize the impact, the impact of not having gathering communal services. We need it. We need it. Listen to your pastor. We need to be in church together. We're doing everything we can to make it safe. Right now, I'm trying to protect the church on this virtual Wednesday night, but we need to get back to the house of God. We can't go virtual for two months again. It hurts too many lives. We're going to be safe. We're going to be wise. We're going to be, we're going to be careful, but we need to be in the house of God together. Can you say, shout hallelujah, somebody. He said, he said, be kindly, be kindly, verse 10. I get, I'm preaching now. I need to get back to teaching. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love. We need to be affectionate one to another. We need to be kind to one another. It's not the will of God to win the argument with our brother. I'll never forget in, a, in, a, in one of the writings of a book I read, a man made the statement. He said that when he was first married, he could win every argument with his wife. He said, not because I'm smarter than her. He said, he said but I was just better with words than she, than, than she was. He said, I'm an author. And he said, when we were first married, we had an argument. He said, I'd win every argument. He said, until I realized every argument I was winning, I was putting a brick on the wall that was separating her from me. 
And he said, I come to my senses and realize I can either win the argument or I can win the, relation, or I can win the relationship, but I can't win both. And I want to say to every believer, you're not always going to agree on every concept, every, every decision. You're not going to agree on maybe even politics in families. And here we are. One study says 7% of families separate completely over politics. And you're not going to agree on every single thing in your life in the body of Christ. You're not going to agree on every protocol, every detail. And you can fuss and you can argue. And you can win the argument, but you'll lose the relationship. And you've got to ask yourself a question when it comes to the body of Christ. Am I going to win the argument? Am I going to win the relationship? Because sometimes winning the argument is not worth the relationship. And he is teaching this narrative. He is saying, listen, your, your actions are affecting somebody. Paul in his writings also said that he said, if it offends my brother to eat meat, I won't eat meat. And Jesus went as far to say, he said that if you offend one of these new ones, because people are watching our actions one toward another. And I've taught we're in Babylon. It's different. It's uncertain. It's, it's not fun. We don't like the restrictions, but... I'm going to tell you, God sent us here. Whether we want to accept it or not, it's where we are. You can call it political, but trust me, COVID-19 is, is not a political flu. It's, it's a real deal. I've never seen anything more infecting. I've never seen things spread faster. I've never seen the effects like this. And, and I've got friends all over the country. This, is a, this isn't just a flu. It's, 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 a, it's a real deal. We've got to be safe. And, uh, and to say it doesn't matter how we, how, we got to be careful. We need to wash our hands. We need to social distance. We under, not, need to understand limitations. We can't make everything into a conspiracy. And, uh, uh, you know, it troubles me when people say that, well, I don't think it's a big deal. I think it's a big deal. I can't tell you how many of my friends have died from this. Uh, we've got to be careful. And you say, well, you know, I don't think it is. Well, maybe you're in a small circle and you don't see it, but... But I know a lot of people that are hurting right now. I know a precious wife that is weeping, Sister Lisa Stalling, because her husband is battling with this right now and needs a divine miracle. He really does. And, and, and Cain got jealous. Cain got jealous of his brother Abel because he, was, he seemingly was more blessed than he was. And instead of being happy for him, he got jealous of him. And what did he do? He, he killed his brother the Lord was so angry in, in Genesis chapter 4 and he come down and said, Cain, where's your brother? And I can't imagine talking this way to the Lord but because certainly I respect him so much. But the, Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? And the answer is yes. We are our brother's keeper. Our actions, our conversations, how we are handle, handle ourselves to one another, whether it be in person, whether it be social media, whether it be... Uh, on our job, whether it be on vacation, no matter where we are, uh, we impact others because we are one of another. I'd like to, I wish I could bring conviction to your home right now and say, how is my actions affecting my children? How is my actions affecting my spouse? And in preaching tonight, how, how are my actions affecting the body of Christ? And he, and he, and he, he says, but be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love and in honor preferring one another. You know, you just can't get a greater, a greater law hardly than the golden rule and, you know, is, is doing to others as you'd have them to do unto you. And sometimes you've got to get in their shoes and, and think, if, if I was in their shoes, would I want to be treated this way? And that's what he's saying. He said, prefer your brother. Prefer one another. I want everybody to say it. Prefer one another. That ought to be the language of every believer is we need to prefer one another. How is this going to affect my brother? How are my actions? How is, how is my attitude? How are my comments going to affect somebody else? Look at verse 11. And he says, don't be lazy in anything you do. It's, it's, it says not slothful in business. And that's what he's saying. Don't be slothful. Uh, don't be lazy. But you need, you, if you're going to do something, uh, what did he say? He said, be fervent in spirit, servant of the Lord. No matter what business you're taking care of on the job, whether all you young people watching, whether it's a school, 
Um, you need to do it. You didn't, don't need to be lazy with your work. You don't need to be lazy uh, as husbands and wives. We don't need to be lazy with the responsibilities we have. We must be fervent in the things that God, everybody hold your hand up, whatsoever my hand findeth to do, I'm going to do it with all of my might. Why? Because everything I do is serving the Lord. Everything I do, the Lord is watching. He goes on and says, rejoicing in hope. Man, when we hear the report of one of our brothers or sisters that there's been, there's been a, a scan of the body and it's better, that's hope. And what do we do? We rejoice. We wave our hands. We clap our hands at church. We give the report. Hey, there's been a breakthrough in Brother so on. There's Somebody in the church has had, a, had, a, had a, a breakthrough in their health. We rejoice in hope. And we rejoice with one another. And somebody say amen. He said we rejoice in hope. And what else? We are patient in tribulation. When problems come, tribulation means pressure. When pressure comes, we don't. We don't lose our minds. As believers, we become steady. He goes on and says, continuing what? Instant in prayer. When the saints deal with pressure, we don't fall apart. We pray. We get a hold of God. When other people crumble, we fall to our knees because we understand that God has declared our end from the beginning. And, and we know his thoughts toward us, that they are good and not evil to give us an expected end. And look what it says in verse 13. It goes on because it's, it's continuing the thought here. Distributing, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. He said, we've got to look around and care for our brothers and sisters because when you're well, somebody has a need. There's always going to be a need. There's always going to be somebody. Instead of worrying about yourself and your future, to be a believer in the body, understanding that you are one of another, that God might have just blessed you because somebody in the church needs something that you have, strength, an encouraging word, some word of wisdom, the Bible says a word fitly spoken is like apples and gold and pictures of silver. And when you begin to look at that, God is going to use, he's blessing you now. The book of Acts, the Bible says they had all things common. Why? Because they took care of one another. This is not, church was never meant just an attendance, a place we attend on the weekends. It's a place where we are connected in spirit, connected in emotion, connected in a lot of ways. He, says, he goes on and says, verse 14, Bless them which persecute you. Bless, everybody say this with me, bless and curse not. He said, we don't curse. We don't cuss either, but we don't curse. He said, bless and curse not. When somebody comes against us, we don't curse them. We bless. Look what it says in verse 15. He said, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. He said in the body we've got to understand the value. The value of rejoicing together. When somebody graduates, when somebody gets a promotion, when, when, when one of these ladies in the church, they have a baby, we rejoice. We clap our hands and welcome them to church and buy them, buy them clothes or they have, they have uh, um some type of baby shower. We, that's rejoicing. Someone gets married. We try to go and celebrate the, those young adults or whoever it is and their families. We try to be there for them. And so we are taught to rejoice. I'm going to word it this way. I, when I've seen it, I remember when God began to bless the anchor, I would be so excited to tell somebody about how many had to receive the Holy Ghost, how many we baptized in Jesus' name, how many we had in attendance, I learned very quickly not everybody's excited about what God's doing in my life. Shouldn't be that way when I call another believer. And, and I, but I'm going to tell you, not everybody's excited about it. They're wrong. They ought to be excited when God's blessing somebody else. But I did have people like Norm Pasley that pulled me aside and said, Brother Bounds, he said, I want you to know I'm going to rejoice in the growth of the anchor. He said, every time you have a breakthrough, he said, he said, I want you to call me. I will celebrate with you. Can I stop here for a minute and ask you two questions? Do you have anybody to celebrate with you? Can I ask the second question? Are you willing to celebrate with someone else? 
You have to know as a believer that your celebration with somebody else is an encouragement to them. We cannot become Cain that refuses to accept that somebody else can be more blessed at a moment than I am now. Can I tell you, if you learn to celebrate with somebody else, somebody's going to be celebrating with you later because God's going to bless you. I am convinced in principle, principle that God will bless somebody near you to see how you respond, to see if you can handle the blessing in your life later. And so here it is, rejoice with them that rejoice. What else did he say? And weep with them that weep. I think we could do better in funeral attendances when it comes. I really do. And uh, if there's a viewing, we go there and support that family that's lost a loved one. I know there's restrictions right now. We've got we to gotta find that. I've preached so many funerals in, in this city. And I've seen some people not have anybody in their life. Because I preach more funerals of non-members than I do members of the anchor. But what I have learned is the significance of your presence in their life. I want you to say to yourself, I am needed in the church. Your presence, I, I teach on it a lot uh, in, in, in other circles, but it's called the power of presence. Your embodiment, Paul said, present your body a living sacrifice. That means doing some things that are inconvenient for you to be acceptable unto God. But when you walk in the building and you are there at a viewing, you're there at the wedding, it is the power of presence. You don't even have to say a word, but when you're near, every single person listening to right now, when somebody looks around and they see you there, you bring an encouragement to them because you are here. There's power in your presence. I want to move on. I don't want to teach long today. Um, I'll be finished shortly. But he said, be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to the men of low estate. This is what he was saying. He said, treat everybody the same. Don't, don't treat somebody in a higher position or bigger financial status or whatever better than you would somebody of a low, lower estate. Um, how do we do that? We just treat everybody the same. We love people. Uh, we should never be treating somebody better than another, uh, another person. We love everybody. And he goes on and says, be not wise in your own conceits. He said, quit acting like you know everything. Quit acting like you, you're, you are, uh, uh, you're the originator of all knowledge. He said, quit acting like you are the stamp of approval, that you, you've got all the solutions. We should never present it that way. The Bible says, as a matter of fact, let our moderation be known unto all men. What does that mean? Act normal. Uh, you might be smarter than somebody else, but just act, just, just, just act normal. Uh, don't, don't try to outdo somebody. Don't try to outdress somebody so they'll think you're wealthier than they are. You know, there's a lot of teaching on that. We're talking about holiness in a lot of ways, but holiness is, is, is the Bible says don't wear expensive apparel. What it's saying is don't try to outdress your brother or, ladies, your sister. Uh, and he's saying just be, just be normal. I'm not saying to be homely, but I'm saying that you shouldn't act like, try to act like you're better than everybody. Uh, why? That hurts people to be arrogant. It really does. hurts people. Uh, just be willing. Let somebody else brag on you. Let somebody else talk about how wonderful you are instead of yourself. Because people need you in their life. They really do. Let's read on. Look what it says. It says, recompense to no man evil for evil. He said, you don't reward. Somebody that does you wrong doesn't mean you have the right to do them wrong. He said, provide things honest in the sight of all men. He said, everywhere you go, you should show yourself honest in every single thing you do. No, nothing deceitful. But people should know that you're honest. He goes on and says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. What was he saying? Everything in you should be seeking to have peace with your brothers and sisters. With all of your might, that's what it's saying. Is you need to try to have peace because that's, that's where God commands the blessing. He says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. He said, here's the narrative. You're not the world. The world is vengeful. The world seeks revenge. When somebody has done wrong, or somebody does them wrong, they're going to do them wrong back. 
But he said, don't be conformed to the world. I know we preach this as a whole in this context of outward, appear, uh, outward appearance. But it's right now, it's talking about how we treat people. He said, we don't think like the Romans think. We don't think the way they think. We're going to love people that do us wrong. We're not going to try to outdo our brother. We're going to try to be there for our brother. He said, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil. That's a mandate. He said, but overcome evil with good. It's time to love one another. Am I my brother's keeper? I am. There are people depending on me. My attitude in this pulpit. My attitude at the gas station. How I treat the waiter and the waitress. How I treat the person that drives slow in front of me in Ohio and they drive in the, in the fast lane slow and they go fast in the slow lane. You know what I'm talking about. I've been here long enough. I have to be careful how I treat people that aren't doing what I want them to do. What am I to do? I must realize somebody is dependent upon me being right with God to be holy, to be separated, to have the mind of Christ and not the mind of this world. Listen, this weekend's going to be powerful. There's somebody that needs you in their life between now and then to encourage them. Exhort, he said in the King James Version. I'm going to tell you what another version is you need to encourage somebody, serve somebody, uplift somebody. And I'm going to tell you, don't leave it all up to pastor. I want you to get your phone out and I want you to call somebody you haven't seen in a while and say, hey, I have missed you, I haven't got to see you. I know services have been back and forth, but I want you to know I, I'm praying for you, I believe in you. Watch what happens. God is going to grow this church. He's going to grow your life. He's going to grow your family. He's going to be with you. God bless you tonight in Jesus' name.